we're singing of the mercies of the Lord, but we need to be sharing of the mercies of the Lord. Listen to me, listen to me, guys, girls, listen. We sing, we've never had better music. I tell you, I love the music. But the bottom line is, thank God we can sing and everybody's got their hands up in our churches and man, it's just, oh, we raised the white flag. We've totally surrendered. Surrender to who? To the music or to the master. When you leave that day, do you move from singing of his mercies? Stay with me to sharing of his mercies. Remember, the longer you know him, the further removed you are from those he died for. You've got to go where they are. Confessions, oh, they're all throughout the text. Let me just move to a, a, a fifth point, try to get it all in. It's what I call restoring, refreshing retreat. Bring back our captivity, O oh Lord. What in the world is that all about? And by the way, this is a Hebrew prayer. Oh Lord, turn again to captive Zion. Here's what you need to know. When God released the children of Israel out of Babylonian captivity, he released them a remnant at a time. They came out singing and shouting, all right? But after you've been out a while, guess what you begin to reflect on? You begin to mature in your faith, and here's what you say. Hey, thank God he set me free, but mama's still over there. Are y'all following with me? I need you to track with me here. Hey, I, I'm so glad God saved me. I'm on my way to heaven. My sins have been forgiven, but Norman's still over there in his sins. Come on, are y'all following me? I mean, I'm telling you, unless you can see where they are, you'll never go where they are. And then I can say, Lord, now I know why my dad left my mom when I was seven. Now I know why he forsook seven kids. Now I know why we were raised in a government project. Now I know why we were welfare kids. I know why daddy didn't care now. He didn't know you. And I remember the first time I saw my dad after my conversion, I said, dad, I got a new father. He said, oh son, did Miss Bessie get married again? I said, no, sir, I got saved. I've got a new father. And before my dad died, God is my witness. I led my dad to faith in Jesus Christ. My brother Norman's been pastor in 20 years. For 20 years north of me, I led my brother Norman to faith in Jesus Christ. Turn again. So restoration was not complete. The partial fulfillment of divine promises encourages us to continue praying for its completion. They're praying for family and friends that are still in exile. And so now they've gone, listen to this, they've gone from the blessing of being saved, listen to this, listen to this, to the burden of being saved. My heart is burdened now. I gotta get mama out. I remember the night my mom came to Jesus. I pleaded with my mom, please go to church. And she came and on a Sunday night, the choir was singing, oh, why not tonight? My mom's in heaven now and the greatest joy is never being able to forget when she was standing beside me and the choir was singing. What an urging song. Oh, why not tonight? And mom slipped out and tonight she made the single most important decision of her life. Many historians of the text and theologians believe that the language is so strong that you can't interpret it just on its surface. Oh Lord, turn again to captivity of Zion. What do you mean? It means that it's so strong that they're saying, God, if you won't send them out, we're going to go back. Amen. Now, you may say, I, I just don't know. Well, first of all, I'm going to support that with scripture, but I want you to listen to me for a moment. I was reading in my room this morning. I've been training Iranians. Every two years, I train about 140 Iranians, and many of them are in prison now. I pray for a fellow by the name of Farshid which he was one of the major church leaders in Tehran. And he was arrested and he's now serving seven years. He's already served three years. And we hear from him periodically out of prison. But some of you know that one of our American Iranians, Iranian Americans has been in prison now, his wife and his children. The president has made reference to it. His name's Hasid. They told him last week that in his own Baptist press the other day, said, Hasid, you continue to tell people about Jesus in here. We will lengthen your time. You will stay here forever if you don't quit witnessing, proselytizing. And listen what to us, Asid said. I'd rather share Jesus than be free. He is in prison serving an eight-year sentence right now. And he said, I'd rather be in prison sharing Jesus than to be free. We're free, but we don't care about those that are in prison. He's in prison. Oh. because he cares about those who aren't free. 
One man gave testimony that I was in prison till yesterday. I'm still in prison, but I hope this makes sense. I'm now free. He, he gave him Jesus. Listen to what Moses said in Exodus 32, 32. Yet now, if you will forgive their sins, but if not, I pray, blot me out of the book. Moses, God, if you're not going to forgive this, blot my name out. That's the Old Testament. How about the New Testament? Paul in Romans 9, 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my country, countrymen, according to flesh. What is he saying? The word accursed is the word anathema. It means devoted to destruction. Let me give it to you in plain vernacular. If it were possible, I would go to hell for my family and friends. Can you remember hearing the stories where people would go into an altar and pray in the old days and they would say, oh God, do whatever you gotta do in my life, but save my boy. And now we're not even praying for the boys. Our heart's not broken over anyone. And so he says, Lord, I don't want you just to restore. Send me back if you need to, but God, I want you to refresh. He says, turn again to captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. That's in the desert. It's referring to torrents. Now, don't miss this. During the dry seasons, the riverbeds would be exposed and empty. And when the rains came, the water courses would be filled and overflowing. That's what's going on in Acts chapter 8. When the Ethiopian eunuch said, see, here's water. What does hinder me being baptized? Well, someone may say, was there, was there a, an oasis? No, the Greek word there is the word wadi, which means the rains had come down out of Jerusalem. And they were just on muddy water. And they said, baptize me in this. He said, um... Well, I can baptize you if you believe. He said, I believe, listen to what he said. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Amen. And he baptized him. You mean that was enough? That was enough. I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he baptized. What all do you expect him to know as a pagan? He's lost. If you're not careful, we so define the gospel that we're afraid to ever call for a decision because we think nobody understands. Charles Spurgeon, I'm reading the newest biography on his life now. And on the plane last night coming over here, I read about his life story. He was converted when he was 15 years old. You know what he said? He said, people talk to me. Listen to this. I'll show it to you. Got the book in my room. He said, people talk to me about the sovereignty of God. People talk to me about all the different theology. He said, but my heart was crying out. Well, somebody tell me how to be saved. And so, so sometimes we talk about, do we get it right? So you know the story. He went to a primitive Methodist church. The pastor couldn't get there because of the snow. And the only reason he went there, he couldn't get to his church because of the snow. And he went in and God is my witness. Here's what Spurgeon said in his own words. He said, I don't mean to be ugly, but the man that preached was stupid. <laughs> but how many of you know that God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick? And so the guy got up and said, look unto Jesus and be saved, all you nations. And then he said, you don't have to read a thousand books to look. He said, all you gotta do is look. We've made it sometimes so complicated. Jesus took a little child, put on his knee in Matthew 18 and said, except you become like a little child and be converted. Instead of us taking little children and telling men to come like children, we've taken men and tried to get children to come like men. Spurgeon said, the man looked and said, there were only 15 people there, he said, you under the gallery, pointing at him. He said, I don't like to be pointed out. He said, but I was under such conviction, I wanted him to talk to me. And he said, you look miserable. <laughs> and he said in his heart, he said, I am miserable. He said, young man, you're miserable. Look to Jesus and be saved. And he said, that night I looked and I got saved. He said, I went home and my family, we threw a party for two hours over what God had done in my life. Man, we've got to get back to that, telling people to look. The psalmist, he sees Israel returning, not as a mere trickle, but as a surging flood. It represents a sudden unleash of God's blessings. He wanted to move from dreams to streams. He, he, he wanted our, our fields that were dry to become wet with the water of God's glory. He knew our churches were dry. He wanted them to be wet. Water in the Bible is a picture of the spirit of God and refreshing life that he brings. That's what he wanted to see. Oh, I got so much I want to say today. Let me try to wrap it up. Tom Rainer said, and I quote, I'm grieved. We're clearly losing our evangelistic effectiveness.
We baptized 4,600 less people with 91 more churches last year. Every year we're increasing the number of churches and we're decreasing the number of people who went into faith in Jesus Christ. So the, what we did, Southern Baptist put together a uh, team and said, come back with a report. And I want to give it to you because I really believe this is right on because it can happen in my own life and it has through the years. That's why I want to say I want to encourage you. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a struggler on this same journey with you. I'm a pastor, don't want to be anything else. I've always had an evangelistic heart for sharing the gospel of Jesus and seeing people get saved, seeing a lot of people get saved. It did me good the other night to be at Peace Baptist Church in Wilder, North Carolina and see the first couple I ever led to faith in Jesus Christ, led them to the Lord 41 years ago. They've been serving them ever since. Can you imagine how little I knew back then and they got saved? And I've never known as much as I know. And sometimes I've never done so little with so much that I know. Did that resonate with anybody else? I'm college trained, seminary trained. I read about every hot book that comes out. If I never read another book, never learn another issue, I know enough already to tell the whole world how to miss hell and make heaven. I've just got to start using what I know. Listen to this. He identified five reasons. I'll give them to you and try to wrap it up. He said the number one, listen to this. This is really, hold on. Please, let's hear this together. Let, let's do something together about this. I wanted, to, I wanted to put this in, so let me throw in a little addendum. Here it is. Praise God, Southern Baptist just gave the largest offering, a Lottie Moon Christmas offering in the history of our denomination. We've got some things we can celebrate and we praise God for it, but we need to, we need to get after it. We want to see that go up so we can continue to touch the nations. But here it is, and, and it's been said long before me, the light that shines to furthest shines to brightest at home. Thank God for what's going on in the foreign field, but the only way to get better over there is for it to get brighter here. Right, here. Here's the problem. Number one reason that we're where we are is spiritual. Many Southern Baptist pastors and churches are not effectively engaged in sharing the gospel and we continue business as usual. We need a sense of brokenness and repentance over the spiritual climate of our churches and our nation. On two different songs that are very popular right now, and I think Matt Redman does one of them, it says this, break my heart for what breaks yours. I'm going to tell you in Jesus' name, I'll guarantee you the lostness breaks the heart of Almighty God. So when you, when you stand and sing, break my heart for what breaks yours, why are you singing and, and doing the job? Pray God break your heart for what breaks his. Come on, guys, in the name of Jesus Christ, the lost world's waiting to hear this message. Number two, it's leadership. I think everything rises and falls on leadership. Many pastors have confessed of being overwhelmed in the operation of ministries of the church to the neglect of being involved in personal evangelism. Uh, this lack of leading by example is negatively impacting our church members' engagement. And the reason is, whatever's important to you is important to them. If it's not important, if you're not constantly up saying, hey, just want you to know, I shared the story yesterday, God is my witness. I led Jeremy and Shannon to faith in Jesus Christ Sunday a week ago, I told the church at 930 how I had the opportunity to lead this couple of Christ. One of my uh, associates in my ministry is here today. I, I introduced him to him after I led him to Christ. They took him to lunch. They were in his Sunday school class yesterday. We want to disciple him. I'm big, I personally disciple three people myself every other week. I'm, I've got a heart. I tell you, Robbie Gallaty, God's really used him in my life in the area of impacting people in discipleship. And number three is discipleship. Many pastors have confessed to focus on attendance while giving little attention to producing fruit-bearing disciples who are involved in intentional evangelism. And the key word is intentional. And there was time out. I'm going to go share the gospel. I'm going to make a visit. I'm taking this family to lunch. I'm going to breakfast with the express purpose that you set across the table and say, hey, I wanted to tell you my story. And, and give them a story. Number four is the next generation. All, although our churches have increasingly provided programs for children, students, and young people, we're not being effective in winning and discipling the next generation of Christ. And that scene, did you hear it a moment ago? 36,000 Southern Baptist churches didn't reach a teenager. Somebody between the age of 12 and 17 did not enter. Just as much as he said, turn again to captivity of Zion, like the streams in the South. You know what we need? Oh, this is good. I'm glad I came. We need, we need the water to flow again in our baptismal pools. I, I want to make a recommendation. And I'm not being ugly. God is my witness. I love you guys. I've given my life to pastors. I've been, I've been Timothy Barnabas minister for 22 years. I'm doing revitalization all over this nation. I care deeply for, I've got, I've got one of the only major city of refuge in the world. 11 pastors cost me $1.2 million to help hurting preachers last year at Woodstock. I'm telling you, I care for preachers. If I didn't baptize anybody, I would pray God break my heart. And I'll call, in the name of Jesus, this is what I do. I would go home and I would go lay 
prostrate in the baptism pool and pray God would allow the streams to flow. I, I would in Jesus' name. I, I, would just, I would go lay in the pool. God, give us reasons to fill this up and use me. Break my heart for a preacher. Last of all, celebration. Many of our churches have chosen to celebrate other things that measure success rather than new believers following Christ. A lot of people say, we had 20,000 Sunday. Let me tell you what really matters. Did anybody meet Jesus? Oh, we worship God. We did this. Did anybody meet Jesus? Did anything of eternal, anything that will outlast you happen? God help us. God help us. God help us to be burdened over a loss. It's got to start where you are. God help us. God help us.